Jeffrey <laughs> came out from the East Coast to do this, and he's going to show us some of the softwares and his art. Uh, radical style. Great. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Jeffrey, and welcome to Radical Digital Painting in Malibu. Thank you all for coming. This is a nice little intimate group, and we have some beautiful flowers here. So, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? All right, let me know if I'm too quiet, okay? And also, this is a more informal type of intimate presentation. So if you have questions, you know, during the show, please feel free to ask. Uh, we'll probably go on for about 30 minutes or so, and then uh, maybe, maybe a little bit longer. So um, what we're looking at here uh, and on the monitor is a work called Tumpin. And as you can see, there's these colored spots that are moving around. And um, it's sort of a, a painting as a, as a clock, a uh, painting as a kind of timepiece. As you can see, I'm weighing uh, timepieces here. Two different ones, right? And the reason why I'm wearing two watches is because my really good friend Goody Pal, he says that if you want to have an idea of what time it is, you always need to wear two watches. And you set one watch to like the internet or something like that, and then you set the other watch to that watch. And so as they slowly start to drift off uh, from each other, then you have an abstract idea of exactly what time it is. And it's important to have a more abstract idea of time and not a more specific idea of time. So these are 16 colorful spots that move around in different arrangements. And it's created with a piece uh, called Dr. Dot, this instrument here, and I'll show you that in a little bit. In a little bit. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today is drawing software. And what is a drawing program? We can look at this book. This book, within this book, is basically a, a piece that is a musical piece. And so here, there's a little target, and it says you're supposed to hammer your fist here, like this. And the sound that your fist makes as you hammer it is the musical piece. And then here, there's some boxes, and you're supposed to shade in those boxes with a pencil as quickly as possible. And the sound that the pencil makes is the musical piece. Now, what I make is I make drawing and painting software that is also artwork. And so you could think about uh, this as sort of a paper version of the things that I'm going to show you on the computer. All right, now let's move on. So this is the first program that I'm going to show you. And it's a very simple program. You can really only do uh, one thing, which is you can copy and you can paste from this block, like this. Copy and paste. Now you might be saying to yourself, oh, Jeffrey, I can do this in Photoshop. I can copy and paste in Photoshop. You know, like Command C, Command V, blah, 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 blah. Well, I have some news for you. The thing about technology that uh, matters to me is that technology for me is always about speed and about space. So changes in the speed of a technology and changes in the space are basically what creates new technology. So in terms of what I make, I don't necessarily think about using the newest machines, but I think about making changes in both speed and in space in order to create new experiences and new ways of thinking about making pictures. So what's the difference here between speed and space? Well, first of all, the space of the program is very limited. You begin with a kind of white square, and there's lots of black. So even though you're copying and pasting, it feels as though you're sort of moving or pushing material around. So it feels more like sculpting. So that's a difference in space. And then, of course, the difference in speed is the fact that um, this operation of copying and pasting, which you could do in other software, is basically sped up so that uh, that's the only action you can do, and it's very intuitive and quick. And so you can sort of develop this whole new kind of world of, uh, of thinking about a picture that way. Now remember, it's copy and paste, so I could always go here and paste, go here and paste, just like that. And then we can fuck stuff up. <laughs> Mess stuff up. Yeah. Not so bad. So one thing I always like to say about this program as well is that most drawing software and stuff, there's like a built-in circle feature, right? And so if I try to make a circle in this software, we're really going against the grain, as you could say, because the software is really not designed to make a circle. So here's my attempt at making a circle. And I like to say that in this software, or in any media that you use, where you're sort of trying to do something that is difficult for the media, trying to sort of represent something, that uh, sort of going against the grain, that's when you're dealing with uh, you know, craft. That's basically the definition of craft in a lot of ways. So here's my uh, excellently crafted uh, circle using this software. So in this software, uh, circle is an art form, I would say. All right, moving on. Now, this is a nice program. It starts painting automatically. And if you don't like what it's painting, you can say no. And here's it's painting something else. I can say no again. And if you do like what it's painting, then you can say paint and it'll start to paint something else. So I can say, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. 
Oh, I do like that. Oh, wait a minute. I'll wait for it to bounce off. And I'll say paint. No. Paint. We'll try to draw a face if possible. Maybe we'll try to wait until something comes around. We need a mouth, basically. Oh, there you go. Perfect. So that's like a little mouth and a nose and two eyes. Now, the thing about this program is it's actually designed. Um, where are we at? Uh oh. Sorry, my QuickTime crashed. Let me load up my QuickTime. QuickTime is very unreliable. Perfect. So the thing about this program is it's actually designed to use one-handed. So if you go to this URL right now on your phone, and I invite you to do that, you can uh, use the software. And so it's a one-handed painting tool where you can say no if you don't like what it's painting. And you can say paint if you do like what it's painting. Now, many of you may, uh, you know, those of you who like make kombucha, I often think of this software as basically being the SCOBY of my paintings because it sort of helps me get started and think of like different ideas. And when I'm ready to go, I just tap here and then I can hold my finger down and save the image. And so usually what I do is I sort of draw on top of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that's no paint. And then there's the URL right there. And now I'm going to show you guys some other uh, iPhone software. Did everybody get the URL? Nopaint.org.js.life. So some other stuff. I'm going to show you a piece of software called Shrub. Now Shrub starts with a blank screen, OK? And now what I can do here is I can go and let's take a look over at the cameraman. And we can capture the cameraman, just like that. And I can change the size of the brush. And maybe now let's look over here. And we'll get Maddie. And you. Like that. So the way that Shrub works is it picks up what's behind the camera and allows you to sort of draw or make a collage with elements from the camera. Like that. And you can turn on a viewfinder to get some more interactivity. And maybe we can do something for me. Yeah, something like that. Pretty nice. And uh, maybe we'll get some of Theo as well. Come over here. Perfect. OK. So yeah, so this is Shrub. Shrub is a pretty nice program. Um, and it uses a camera. I'll show you one more program that uses a camera. And these programs are all available on the, on the App Store. So Finger Quilt is very similar to Shrub. Finger Quilt is designed to work on a grid. where you can tap squares in the grid, like this, and make a drawing that way. Um, and so what I'll do here is I'm actually going to show you my sketchbook. So here's my sketchbook. And we can go look at some things and grab things in the grid, like so. So these are some of my drawings that you can see. And I'll talk a little bit more about these later. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass around this book and explain some of my drawings on the wall after I finish uh, showing you all the software. OK, so that's Finger Quilt. And uh, a very special thing, today I have a brand new app available for you guys. So this is also an app launch party. Okay, This is an iOS app launch party. So if you go to the iOS app store, you can go to get soft wallpaper. And the wallpaper that I've designed here on my phone uh, was made with soft wallpaper. So I'll show you a bit of soft wallpaper. Here's one that I already had baking. So let's reset. So the idea behind soft wallpaper is that you're always basically making a pattern. And it's a wallpaper designer for your phone. So the tagline is, make a beautiful wallpaper for your phone in 10 seconds or less. And then when you're done, you can save the wallpaper like this. You can do some other nifty things. You can make polka dots. And you can also pick colors and do that kind of thing. So soft wallpaper is completely free. You can go to the App Store and get it. Perfect. Soft wallpaper, everybody. All right, so let's move off the phone and back into Spotify. I'm just kidding. Let's go to Google Chrome. So we're leaving no paint, and now we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the year 2011, to the first drawing software that I've ever created. And this is the first program that I wrote as well. So this program is called the PR Bat, the Polygon Replicating Bitmap Authoring Tool. And if you're a programmer or software developer, this is kind of like the Emacs or the Vim of digital painting. So here's the manual here. 
Here's my keyboard shortcuts, you know, very complicated kinds of things. It's basically designed to uh, replicate the control scheme of Quake 3, which is a game I played a lot of. Uh, so WASD, that kind of stuff. And so I wanted to make something that was really different from Photoshop. And Photoshop always asks you, what's the width and the height of your image? And so I said, well, I'm going to ask you, what's the shape of your image? Because Photoshop assumes that your image is going to be a rectangle. And so here I've drawn the shape of my paper. And now what I have to do is I have to actually draw, maybe I can trace your head. Now I have to actually basically draw a, a tool, or I sort of have to make a brush. So I made this shape here, but this shape is just an overlay. And what I do is I lock it in, and it, you see it over there. And now what I can do is I can actually draw with that shape. So you don't have any built-in brushes in this software. You basically have to make all of your own brushes, if that makes sense. So let's make one more. I'll turn this one off and make a new one. And you might be saying, oh, Jeffrey, this is some pretty cool software. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but you're like, oh, but Jeffrey, all the cool painters these days, they use airbrushes. You know? And this looks like you know, pretty jaggy kind of, kind of stuff. I don't know if I can really use this because I want my paintings to look cool and like airbrushy. Well, if you make something like this, which is like a series of sort of transparent shapes. And then we spin things around. Maybe we'll pick like a pinkish color or something. And reduce the opacity. Then, you know, you can build yourself a nice airbrush. So you might think, oh, Jeffrey, like, I want to be really hip and use airbrushes. Well, you can be hip and use airbrushes. Or you can go retro and, you know, be blocky and pixelated. So it's got the best of both worlds, to be honest. Um, all right, so the other thing you can do, we have this little device here. We can spin this thing around. So it doesn't have to have a particular orientation. And, you know, we can make patterns. All right, so let's bring in some camera action. Oh, wait, that's actually loading an image. Let's do this. Yeah, and if you want to know, this is super lame. This is made in Adobe Flash. So. Like that. All right. Let's kick it. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> uh, we can turn the menu off. Yeah, so some other stuff that the software has before I move on is you can do a four-dimensional copy and paste. So let's make a new brush here, something like that. And let's say I wanted to do, like, uh, I don't know, I wanted to just write a letter, like uh, M, I'll write Maddie's name, A, T, and now all I have to do is hold down my mouse, and it will sort of start to repeat that form, like so. So copy and paste is usually like copying and pasting pixels. And of course, I can do that. I can go ahead and copy these pixels and move them around, um, or draw with them. You know, that's pretty much, that's pretty straightforward. But this is copy and paste through time and space. So. Basically, I can you know, rewrite Matt's name or different parts of his name. I can rotate the canvas while doing it. And so you get a kind of freeform copy and paste where you can improvise. The other cool thing about this program is that you can actually change colors while you're drawing. So if I wanted to do something like this, there, then I could go ahead and make a cutout like this. And I can draw like that. Pretty good. So we'll just do this one more time. All right. OK, moving on. So let's go back to this piece, all right, and the piece that you see on the monitor over there. So this is made with 16 colorful spots. And um, I'm going to show you actually how this piece was made. So it's part painting tool, part uh, sort of dot recording device. Now um, we have to refresh this page. There we go. So I begin with this little spot here. Maybe I'll make the monitor white so it's a bit easier to see. So I have this black spot. And here's my X and Y axis. And this is basically kind of Etch-a-Sketch controls. So the left side control is X, and then this is Y. And then everything else is basically the Etch-a-Sketch plus a bunch of acid. And if you, you can change the opacity of your dot. You can change the color of your dot. Red, green, blue, et cetera, et cetera. You can change the size and you can sort of change the thickness or the softness of the dot. And then what you can do is you can plop dots down on the screen in a sort of Etch-a-Sketch-like fashion, but instead of uh, 
you know, making uh, lines, you're just making these spots. So let's go black. I can zoom in and out. So I'll do something like that. Pan around here. Something like that. Let's zoom out again. Yeah. So there's my little guy. Now, the thing is, this software is a vector-based software. So I can zoom way out like that. And um, I can still get, you know, sort of like accurate uh, sort of representation. Like, you know, things don't really get pixelated as I zoom in or out. Yeah, I can even go in further, et cetera, et cetera. So let's zoom out here. And I'm going to rewind like that. And let's bring it back to uh, where we were. OK. Now, the other thing that you can do in this software is you can record a dot over time. And that's how these pieces are made. So I can set it up in such a way so that I can hit the record button and change colors. And then now that's a dot that I just recorded through these different actions. So I can do one more here. So there's a recording of that dot. And I can keep moving the dot around and making recordings in this way. So I'll change the opacity like this. And that's then going to be recorded. And let's do, uh, let's make another picture. So here, let's just do one that's, uh, you know, like all sorts of random colors, like this. And then we'll go up and we'll do another one that's all sorts of random colors. And what I'm building here is a kind of futuristic traffic light. So this is the kind of traffic light that self-driving cars will see in the future. And you know, you and I might not necessarily understand like what the light means, but the cars will be like, oh yeah, 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 okay, I have to go this way, or you know, oh there's traffic on the four or five or you know something like that. So they'll have a good idea. So this is a futuristic traffic light we're building. Like this. Very cool. Now you might be thinking, oh Jeffrey's up to something. And that's true. I'm kind of up to something. Because in addition to this software being able to record spots and move spots around and build compositions like this, these spots can also be uh, reused in a sense. Um, they can, uh, in effect, be painted with, like this. So here I am on a canvas, and I'm painting with my brush, which I have sort of built for myself, just like that other older piece of software that I've showed you. Now if you look, if I go towards the edge here and I paint, you'll see that it kind of comes up on the right side. And that's because what I'm building is a kind of tiled image. And I can pan as much as I want in any direction and maintain the integrity of the image. And if I zoom out, there's the picture that I'm building. So this is also a wallpaper designer, as you might say. All right, now let's move on to this thing so we can kind of like video game this. Boop. Boop. Yeah, pretty nice. All right, but if we want to get real crazy, we can turn on the brush mode. And then we can drag and move things around like this, bounce around. Pretty fun. And if we zoom out, start to make more of a pattern. And you know, if we uh, really want to kick things off, we do something like this. All right, now let's turn up the volume a little bit. Yeah, that's all with one brush. Just that little traffic light brush. Pretty nice. And here's our first brush in action. All right, so this piece of software is called the Dr. Dot. And let's go back to the reset mode. And this is how it always begins. So this is my Dr. Dot device. And as you saw, it was used to make this piece here. Okay, so 
The last thing I'm going to show you here on the monitors are some of my digital paintings. And in order to do that, um, I'm going to use my handy PlayStation controller. So maybe I'll come back here a little bit. And uh, yeah, so this is my slideshow software. So here you can see these are my digital paintings. This one here is uh, 512 by 512 pixels. Perhaps I'll move my mouse out of the way. 512 by 512 pixels here. And there's some different features. So there's a clock here. There's a Kirby. Anyway, let's look at some more. One, two, three. This is a bush from the Zelda game for Game Boy. Here's another. This is a guy on a phone running around. <laughs> There's Mario jumping. This kind of spider thing. This is me driving my car and crashing my car. It's a 93 Volvo, as you can see. And uh, it says here, I love my car. Yeah. And then there's my mom. She's really upset. You know, my mom's like, ah! Yeah. So this is my slideshow program. And you can't see right now, but if you, uh, as I progress through some of my pictures, these are pictures here that are made on my phone. So these are all my iPhone paintings that we're looking at. As I progress through these, you'll notice that there'll be a progress bar on the bottom of the screen. Some bars are obscuring it right now. You can maybe see on my laptop, there's this progress bar. And I always like to have a progress bar in my slideshows because when I was in art school, like art history class, you know, the teacher would always like load up a bunch of slides and then I would be like, when is this gonna end? You know, you'd have like no con conception. Even when they're showing video art or something like that. Um, so we'll go through some of my uh, iPhone pictures. And if you have any questions, now would be a good time also to ask questions. Letters and numbers. The letters and numbers. Well, it's my initials of whatever pseudonym I'm using. So in this case, Jeffrey Allen Scudder. The year, 2016. The month, the day, and uh, that's 2.13 PM. Now, sometimes I'll also put in the latitude and longitude. Um, because I think that, you know, digital painting has the potential to go into outer space more so than regular paintings do. And so I think that, you know, it's good to sort of have an earthly uh, address, you know, for the paintings. Um, both for people on Earth and for people off Earth. This is the San Francisco Flower Conservatory. This is made with shrub and then I drew on top of it. So a lot of my, you know, I don't just use my software to make paintings, I also use all the commercial software and then use my software and like, you know, pieces of my software basically. I was taking care of my nieces in Alaska, and um, uh, so I had like a niece in one hand and like an iPhone in the other, and I was drawing, and like these were the drawings that my nieces were making. So here's some drawings by my niece. This was made using finger quilts, so I was like, you know, making a grid-based photograph and then drawing on top of it. This is a dish that my niece was using for her snacks, and I turned it into this like pumpkin face. This is a Barbie that was hung off of the couch with a um, shoelace. And these are sausages that I was making for my nieces. And that's my niece Sage dancing naked in the TV room. Disco style. They're like three and two years old. And I'm gonna jump through a bunch of these iPhone ones. There's some David Hockney iPad paintings back there nod to David. This is a butt plug that's also a spider. And it's this blonde girl. This is some cosmic kale that was in my sister's garden. And some Play-Doh that I was playing with. This is also with my nieces. I was not using the butt plug with my nieces. That's separate, different <laughs> vibes. Uh, so this is spinach that I was eating. There's some onions. So basically, I was eating a salad, and I took a photo of the salad. This was on a bus. Uh, this is the cup holder in that bus. So these are all shown in order of the time that they were made. So we're going through time right now. So we're still in 2016. This is the uh, display at my abandoned shopping mall in Taunton, Massachusetts. And there's like this cosmic uh, Pepsi sort of thing. And this display was broken, so I drew on top of it. Um, anyway, let's continue on a little bit faster. Oh, this is the first one that I put my cat in. Here. <laughs> yeah, Death Wish. So many of the marks on these uh, 
In these paintings, some are made in different software and they're sort of imported into Autodesk Sketchbook Pro, which is what I like compose things with on the phone. Now this is the first one where I put a picture of myself in. And I thought, like, what's the lamest thing that I could do to like certify that I was the author of the painting? And so I thought I would put this really rad you know, portrait of myself in the corner. And you'll see that motif continue over time. So I still have my uh, you know, JAS signature, and then here's the latitude and longitude in this piece. And this is a really cool one. Oh yeah, nice. Okay. Um, this is like a bird. This was actually made with two cell phones. So I was doing like long-term exposure with one phone and moving it around in space. So you get these kind of effects. So I went from using, I went from making paintings on my phone to making paintings using two phones. And then this series here that you're watching now is all made with two phones. And uh, I still use that to get certain kinds of effects. This is a, um, an invitation to my students at UCLA for my class digital painting, where I invited them to program their own tools, blah, 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 blah. When I, I say something very funny, I say, painting is a felled tree in the forest of media, but I am the tall, glowing mushroom that rots its pigment. Now I can see the whole forest, but its eyes are in the dirt. And then I ask them to grow with me this quarter. Yeah, so uh, very poetic, you know, kind of stuff. And there's like a sideways Picasso uh, up here. Uh, there it is, yeah. It's a master copy of a Picasso. Okay. Some other stuff. And I'm gonna skip through most of the iPhone paintings now. These are made with uh, finger quilts only. So this is like an extension cord that I was drawing with in the grass and just taking like photos and trying to draw with the lines of the extension cord. And these are some objects I was moving around. Now again, so some crazy sexy stuff. Jeffrey in bondage as part of the clouds. Flying into LA, you know, this is from the plane. I was making this on the plane. Not in bondage on the plane, but you know, that was a different photo shoot. Uh, so here's a piece by the artist Casey Reese, so the inventor of the processing programming language. And there's an elevator button that's also a flower, and this flower comes from the painter Hilma Op Klimt, the supposed inventor of abstraction. And then here's a nipple with a nipple ring. Um, oh yeah, and then there's this cat here that was, I found at a yard sale. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And this, this painting has a very important statement about technology. It basically says, another thing is I was once quoted, sometimes you only have to step three feet to the left and the whole insane machine goes roaring by or something like that. And so for me, that's kind of a statement about the invention of, you know, people who make their own technology, sometimes they don't have to go mainstream. They can only just step one step to the side or two steps to the side. And then everything, that ru everything just rushes by them and they can do their own thing. So that's kind of how I feel about my own life. <laughs> this is a motivational poster. It says, uh, you're weirder than the weed and stronger than the coffee. And yeah, this is a poster that I think should be in all high schools, like in guidance counselor offices and stuff like that. Um, this is from Seattle. Okay, but you know, this, the thing is, we're only halfway through the slideshow, so I'm gonna skip ahead. Uh, oh yeah, this one's pretty funny. This one says, uh, I'm not a yoga guy. Uh, <laughs> um, portrait of my, my friend Lydia. This is like, I was watching this lecture, this lady, and so I just put her in there, because she matched the colors of the painting I was working on. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to remember, you know. I want to remember. These are my dad's pills. And this is actually my dad's hand. My dad's pretty old, so he has a wrinkly hand, so I use his wrinkles for the ground. And these are paintings that were made in Photoshop here. Now we're in 2017. And during this period, I was feeling maybe more like this. Yeah. Getting close. There's a guy rowing a boat. How often do you hide your penis? Uh, we'll get to one that has my penis in it. Uh, <laughs> I can show you that one. This is, uh, this is uh, my controller that I'm using right now, that you can see. Um, this is, uh, you know, it says uh, here, making pictures is the best video game. Make your own tools. Um, and I actually say that over here. So if you look over here, it's a little bit uh, race now, but it says uh, painting is the best video game right there on the bottom. Yeah. And I'll talk about those slides in a little bit. This is a sort of aspirational thing. It says coffee and protein in my own apartment, things that I think about. Uh, some flowers, beautiful flowers. This is another statement about technology. It says, where the fuck is my horseless fucking carriage? which is, uh, you know, if you don't know this, the original term for car, like automobile, was horseless carriage. Um, 
some more. But you want the penis, so we kind of find that. You have to go. You have to go forward a little bit. Forward to the penis. So now we're starting to enter 2018. So you've got your whole body of digital paintings documented in the slideshow. Yeah, so the slideshow is all my digital paintings. So over time, you know, in 10 years, this will be like a three-hour show. <laughs> yeah, this is some poop that I saw in San Francisco, and I thought, like, well, you know, if someone's gonna poop on the street in San Francisco, I gotta like, you know, I gotta work, I gotta rock that. So yeah, I tried to rock it the best I could. What's that? This is crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then this is a flower. This is a flower. And people were saying, like, OK, so Jeffrey, like, how much LSD were you on when you drew this flower? And I, and I was not on any LSD when I drew this flower. And I bought an iPad and tried to draw some iPad paintings. Uh, this is uh, Lydia talking to Jared Lanier. Um, that's about it. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and here I was really getting into the Instagram filters. This is my puppy dog, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I was trying to like mess with caterpillars because caterpillars kind of look like those digital marks if you think about it that way. Oh yeah, and I forgot. Here's me with a rainbow in my phone. Hot shit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll turn around and raise the drone in a minute. Oh yeah, yeah. Please, please, please come. Tell me. All right, so if I find the penis one, then after I show the penis, we can uh, wave and wave around. We all really want to see your penis. I mean, it's not, it's, it's behind <laughs> underwear. It's, it's, yeah, but it's like actually my underwear. I mean, that's the thing, you know, if it was a real painting, I could like paint my penis, and then I could like paint on top of it, like the underwear. And so like in the future, they could like peel back the layers and like my penis would be there, right? But this is digital painting, so you can't do that. The surface is just the surface. You know, you can't put anything underneath the pixels. And that's really what makes digital painting different from other, other forms of painting, is that all the magic and the mystery of digital painting has to come out of something else other than what's behind the surface. Because the surface is just so boring. You know, the surface is regulated, it's defined. These paintings are kind of interesting. They're designed to be rotated in any direction. So when I was painting them, I was just, uh, you know, rotating them 90 degrees every, every so often. So they're images that are designed to sort of work in all four orientations. And I was originally designing them as a set of table cards, like tarot cards, so that if you had them on a the table, you could look at them in any direction and they would sort of make sense as pictures. Thanks. Yeah, and I was about to produce the deck of cards, but then I didn't have any more money, so I didn't make the deck of cards. But now I have the paintings. That's no, okay. <laughs> All right, see here. This is a nice one. You know, I don't know if I actually have the the penis one. I may have passed it like a while ago. It's very, it, it's not very, it's very hidden. So these are my no date series because I thought, you know, I'm, so far I've always done dates, but I'm gonna have a special series uh, for people where there's no date, but there's there's numbers. So this is uh, no date number two. This is the one you want to buy. Yeah. This is no date three. This is a political painting uh, that I made with my friend Arthur. So this is created using a sort of painting game where we paint on the same computer, and we have a three-minute timer here. And every time the three-minute timer is up, we just swap Wacom tablets or whatever. So we're using the exact same computer, sitting side by side and painting together, and just not having any idea of what's going to come out. Uh, this is painted with me and my friend Arthur. No, we're doing thumbnails right now. Because uh, the original files, so uh, these, this picture right here, for example, is like 50,000 to 50,000 pixels. So I can't even load it into RAM and zoom in and stuff without uh, you know, losing performance. So this is a skater bro um, that I painted with my friend Arthur. In the future, skater bros I think will be super cool, like cooler than they've ever been, but they'll still always want the chicks. So there's Skater Bros saying like, oh, check me out, girls, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he has like a cool Speedo, and he has Lululemon skate shoes, you know. <laughs> he's, like, he's like super cool, super cool. And this is also painted with Arthur using the same game. So here's our signatures and our portrait there. And this is a painting about toxic masculinity. Arthur and I are in Boston. And uh, we saw this guy who was drunk and hugging his like, girlfriend, and she was on the phone. And I thought, well, maybe toxic masculinity is just literally this guy intoxicated 
like hanging off his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, and, and I thought, well, maybe he was like reading Jordan Peterson's book too much <laughs> and it's like getting wasted. So this is like 12 rules for life. You can see there's like gold and white, but it's kind of, you know, it's encoded. You don't really know unless I explain. And then uh, there's these chromosomes, like Y chromosomes with zeros and ones and X chromosomes. And he's like drinking an X and Y chromosome bottle. Yeah, so this is the toxic masculinity, you know. Uh, and there's me and Arthur. Yeah. <laughs> this is also painted, you know, with our three minute sort of game. And this is one with me and Julia. Julia is one of my other collaborators here. And we've only played this game once, but, uh, but yeah, this is a nice painting that we did together. And um, yeah, here's another iPhone painting. So now we're in 2018, 427. So this is just uh, a couple weeks ago, really, like a month ago. And this painting was just made the other day, just finished the other day. 2018, 6-1. So two days ago, I finished this. And that's the end of the show. So maybe we should turn around and say hi to the drone. Yeah, right. right? Okay, sure. one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. So I think what we're going to do now is perhaps we'll look at some of these slides and I'll explain a few things. Now, before we finish, yeah, I'm going to talk about some of these slides. Is it okay if I walk around? I'll walk down a little bit. Okay, so yeah, I brought these slides here. Uh, sometimes I have like a blackboard when I give my lectures, but in this case we have these glass panels. And so here's a drawing that I did that is sort of in the freestyle mode, as you can see. And um, basically I just, I just made a fun drawing, you know, for a certain period of time. And so there's this figure and this like sort of my language and that sort of thing. And then, and then this drawing here is a special kind of game Right? And this game is called Flower Eater. And so the idea behind Flower Eater is that, um, oh yeah. The idea behind Flower Eater is that you have this flower here. And so there's the stem of the flower. And there's like these two circles with a line. And then this entire drawing is basically made in that mode where every single mark is like two circles with a line, two circles with a line, two circles with a line. Sometimes you can do like this two circles with a line, right? And so basically the idea behind Flower Eater is to create a kind of score drawing in the same way that you have like a notation for a piece of music, you can also have notation for a drawing. So in a way, this is like the custom brush, you know? So you sort of build a brush and you abstract the media of your actual pen and you say, I'm using this virtual pen, which is this virtual technology, this imaginary technology, which is basically these two circles connected by a line. Uh, so, that, so that's an example of Flower Eater. And I can actually show you Maybe, yeah, so you know, if I do another flower eater here, we can say like, oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, so here's like an X with a circle, right? And so that's a flower. And then we'll do one more. We'll do the Julia bead here, right? So now the idea is maybe I would have, uh, a dice or something? Do I have a dice? I don't, oh, I have a coin, okay. So if it's heads, I'll use this. If it's tails, I'll use that. So it's heads, so I'll use that. So now I'll do like a circle with an X. And then next, tails, so now I have to do that. Yeah, anyway, so that's the idea. So then the idea is you can have as many sort of flowers as you want. And then these flowers are kind of like custom brush psychedelic drugs. And so you eat the top of the flower and then that's all you want to draw. So that's sort of the RPG element of the game, if that makes sense. Maybe I'll just... Okay, so let's move on. Uh, now this one here. So we're talking now about the idea of resolution in drawings. Okay, so now we're talking about the idea of resolution, okay? So generally, we usually think of resolution in terms of like how much detail an image has, right? So what I say here is resolution has more to do with behavior than it does with fidelity, okay? So if we think about resolution, resolution is like you only have so many pixels. So what do you do with the pixels, right? Now, at low resolution, 
you might have you know one two three four five six seven eight nine different objects and you can move those objects around right so our resolution here is basically you have like you know these are pixels but they're not a good grid and you can sort of move them around so basically at low resolution the primary thing you do is you arrange things or you move things around so low resolution is kind of like for designers you know or writers where they use the alphabet or something like that and then if you have a lot of little things like a lot of little objects uh, maybe like if you think of the sand, right? In the sand you have lots of little tiny objects, right? And it doesn't really make sense to move those objects around one by one, but instead what you do is you carve through them, right? So rather than moving each grain of sand around to make a composition, you actually carve through the sand. And so that's where you get the idea of mark making. You can only make a mark if you have enough particles to sort of move through or push around in aggregate. So you can't make a mark with just one little bead or one little particle. You need multiple particles. So you get the idea of drawing and painting at this sort of middle resolution level. Then at high resolution, you get the idea of scanning something in. So you can do a sort of handprint, right? If your material is so fine-grained enough that you just sort of like walk like water, then you can get like a thumbprint or something like that. So the highest resolution is the level of the scan basically, where, you know, this is the sort of thing that governments are interested in. They want to, like, you know, they want to scan you, and they want, like, the highest amount of fidelity possible, and that sort of thing. So, the thing is, each of these levels changes the way that you actually produce images, and think about making images. So, it's not just about how much detail does the image have, it's about what ways do you manipulate the image at different levels of resolution, okay? So, that's basically my idea of low medium and high resolution is that at low resolution you are arranging things, at medium resolution you're making marks, um, and then here you're making scans. So you get these different ideas. So at low resolution you have the idea of the composition and you can undo or redo something. At medium resolution you can delete a mark or erase a mark. And then with a the scan you can actually really delete the scan. Because if you've ever taken a photograph and like shot the same photograph twice in the same place, they're like not the same. So if you delete one photograph, you can really delete it forever. So whereas with the mark, you can erase the mark and redraw it, with the scan, you can really delete a scan because it's so high resolution you can't reproduce it. So some other things here. These are some phrases from uh, my piece, 10 Minute Painting, which we'll watch at the end of the lecture. And over here, this is also from 10 Minute Painting. It says here, pixels need not be the same size, nor side by side in a grid. And then here's some examples of sort of a low resolution idea of like each of these would be like a pixel and I'm sort of moving them around. So I'm arranging things in a way. Now let's go over there. I'll try to speak up a little bit. <clears throat> so here's just a simple suggestion. <clears throat> I would like you all to search for radical computer music. It's very similar to Radical Digital Painting. It's by my friend Goody Pal. And so if you Google Goody Pal, you'll find a lot of information related to music that's very similar to this. And here's one of my favorite quotes about software. It basically says, software is an imaginary machine that runs on a real one. So if you think about software, software is a kind of disembodied imaginary machine. And in order for software to actually work, it needs to have some kind of body some kind of machine body or organic body. So we can think of software now as not just being something that runs on computers, but we can think of, say, Flower Eater, the game Flower Eater, as a kind of piece of software, and it could run on a computer, or it could run uh, in your mind or with a couple people. So I would invite you to think about software as something that is not just for a computer, but is also for your mind. Um, and a lot of software systems involve people throughout. What else? Oh, and then I talk a little bit about software literacy. So I say, in the future, software will not be made by small groups for many millions of users, which is the situation now. But I think if everyone learns to program, then software will be made by smaller groups for even smaller groups. So if you think today about how not many people are programmers, but many, many people have learned to read and write, uh, in the past, many people did not know how to read and write. And so priests were the readers and the writers. So I think that the best way to disrupt the status quo is actually to teach programming, in a way, uh, in terms of the software status quo. And then I say something, the media is not the message. Now, this is also just some flower eater stuff. So, I want to talk about this phrase really quick. The media is not the message, which is, you know, kind of a joke. But before we go into 10-minute um, painting, I want to sort of explain what I mean by the media is not the message. You want to fix my cord? 
and we can pass this around. So the media is not the message. You know, Marshall McLuhan, this media theorist, was famous for saying the media is the message. Basically saying like television or whatever you're watching, uh, social media, you know, the content or the meaning behind the television itself and the apparatus, the social and economic and production apparatus of television is more important than the content of the television, um, which is sort of, which is of course true. But the content, I would say, is equally as important. And often, um, in terms of uh, certain abstract media, like in terms of literature, for example, you know, we have this idea of like the story. And the story could be in a novel, or it could be in a poem, and it could be printed, or it could be spoken. And so really, when you really want to privilege the story, you want to think that the media is not the message, right? And so often in the fine arts and in painting, we think about like the, the meaning of the material. Like how meaningful is it that you used uh, you know, like if I were to make a painting on, uh, on a surfboard, then the surfboard becomes kind of meaningful or whatever, right? Whereas what I'm doing here with radical digital painting is we're really thinking about taking the idea of painting and making it not media specific. So we're turning painting into the idea of just the story in general, if that makes sense. So I like to say with radical digital painting, the media is not the message. You know, the message is the message, if that makes sense. Okay, so we have one final thing to show, and that's this video, 10 minute painting, and it's 10 minutes long. And after that, I think that'll be a wrap. But are there any questions, perhaps? Oh, when I do the no date series, so I delete the date from the metadata. No. No. Well, because metadata is so frivolous that by the time, you know, I don't know, I don't really know if it will be. Uh, yeah, the thing is, I just don't trust metadata. I don't think metadata is that trustful. So that's why I actually put the metadata into the into the paintings themselves. You know, I put, I put the metadata inside the picture as part of its content. Okay. Uh, infinite. Oh, with the wallpaper. Uh, if you zoom in, it's a raster grid, so you can see the pixels. Um, so it is like not infinite, no. It's like a grid of pixels and stuff. But the dots that you're producing, those are sort of in like an infinite vector space. So the idea there is that you're going from the level of the arrangement of low resolution sort of moving these dots around directly to the level of the mark where you have lots of pixels and you're sort of plotting pixels. And of course I would love to make it infinite, but the thing is computers only have so much space and, and sort of so that sort of thing. So always when you make graphic software, we're negotiating between these different levels. Most vector graphic software is all about arranging things, right? Uh, and that's also what designers do. Okay, so let's continue with 10 minute painting. Final questions, any other questions? Pass the sketch with grounds. And let's hit it. 10 minute painting by JAS, 2017, August 7th at 7.30 p.m. Semper 1.0.0, compiled for Academy Schloss Solitude and ZKM, Center for Art and Media. Web URL, 10minutepainting.com. What are the forms of non-painting and what are the non-forms a painting might take? Painter David Hockney once said, video brings its time to you, and you bring your time to painting, and that difference will always be there. What would it be like to play a painting? It would be the most beautiful thing in the system. It would be more beautiful than the platform itself. A beautiful painting is a painting that can be run over and over again. You are looking at a painting comprised of many wayward bits. Listen. A beautiful painting is a poem that can be executed over and over again. Repetition is the only thing that makes something less random than it already is. Video games are the most recent form of filmmaking known to the human retina. That is why video games are rarely mistaken for books. Books, like video games, are alive only in the moments they are being read. Top mathematicians and painters often work at the same scale. The professor's large mural-sized blackboard serves as a liminal space by which abstractions are developed, whereas the painter's substrate serves as an indelible artifact of material arrangement. Professors have just as much of a fetish for their tools as oil painters do. They prefer Hagoromo, a discontinued brand of Japanese chalk over anything else, and are keen on porcelain surfaces. They enjoy the lyrical mark-making capability of chalk, and even share techniques like breaking the stick in two and drawing with its side to render calligraphic lines. A viral video of physics professor Walter Lewin's blackboard work shows this fetish is shared by a much wider audience. 
There is a collective disdain for dry erase whiteboards which are often derided as inferior in capability and more difficult to maintain than the blackboard. Whiteboards operate in a more uniform world where their marks look consistent regardless of the individual that drew them. Perhaps this is why they are more popular in business meetings. They silence the aesthetic of the individual in favor of the group. All digital media objects exist as a collection of reproducible bits, and so, their materiality yields little meaning. Because of this, painting today aspires to be understood through a set of abstract terms, similar to those which have been developed for mathematics and poetry. A painting is just a kind of picture message. Video games are nothing less than stylized learning curves. And everyone knows video games are for total losers who live with their families. Paint brushes, like guns and PlayStation controllers, are content management systems for your field of view. This is why painting is the best video game. World news as a landscape versus. World news as a stream versus. Handwritten cursive in the margin of something printed. My mother is a great quilter, for what it's worth. The best way to consume a photograph is to take one immediately. Then you can hold it directly in front of your face. To arrange elements in a virtual space, one must define that space. Things that are real versus. Things that are fake versus. If a painting is defined as an abstract container capable of representing two colors, then there are only two possible paintings. If poems were only one letter long, using an alphabet containing two letters, then there would only be two possible poems. With an alphabet of seven letters, I can configure rainbows all fucking day. This program is now in dialogue with its own material delivery. The poem program you are looking at is comprised of over 65,536 reproducible picture elements or pixels. Each of these is capable of representing over 16.7 million colors. It takes place in real time, and like a deck of cards, it is the same no matter how it is shuffled. The icons appearing on the edge of the frame are used in lieu of a progress bar. You will see 124 of them, in addition to more flowers by the time I stop speaking. My voice is triggered by the Web Speech Synthesis API. The sound and gender is dependent on the browser software implementers, your machine's operating system, and my personal preferences. The names we give to the constituents of a painting are more important than what they are actually made of. Paintings, like beds, are frames within which dreams are broadcast. The arithmetic for calculating the number of possible combinations of pixels here is more than 65,536 to the power of about 16.7 million. The resulting integer is very wide, but not infinite. Similar to web browsers, software like Mac Paint or Photoshop allows users to surf these fast but limited visual spaces through opinionated means, such as plotting individual pixels, filling large regions, and filtering the entire set of pixels at once. Each new painting program or feature that gets introduced into the ecosystem allows for more focused and opinionated surfing of these spaces. Surfing is always more fun than permutation. If scratching is a process by which hidden things expose themselves, then we can say that all paintings are made from scratch. Gridded, linear arrangements of pixels make them easy for digital computers to read, but difficult for humans to process and memorize. Screen pixels are becoming smaller, more numerous, and less visible to the eye. And now we will consume a more open definition of them. Pixels need not be the same size, nor side by side in a grid. They don't need to be made of the same material. They can be as abstract as possible, determined only by the highest level of meaning they are able to obtain. By this understanding Rothko's signature paintings are to be interpreted as just a few pixels in width and height, and several pixels deep. By raising the meaning of a pixel higher than that of a singly colored gridded unit, we can study paintings and modify or re-execute them as easily as if they were mathematical formula. I have a painting for you now. Three Swedish fish candies stare at one another in a circle. One is flipped over, another shiny. It has been sucked on and spit back out. A little square just appeared on the edge of the frame. It happened again. A wall is being built here in case you haven't noticed. Abstraction A, Abstraction B, S Expression. If one doesn't have infinite scroll, it is necessary to invent it. Jack Kerouac hacked his typewriter to accept rolls of paper instead of sheets. Peace Pilgrim retired to a life of endless walking, and network information systems are engineered to update themselves without turning off. 
schools are starting to teach cursive handwriting again. This poem's text is represented by a standardized possibility space limited to exactly 1,114,112 characters or code points. This is the exact opposite of cursive. It is for this reason that all punctuation marks are traffic signals. My commute is very pleasant here. There is enough time to play with my Tamagotchi. Painting equals tic-tac-toe. Mural equals Game Boy. Picture frames are orbiting satellites. I am a square, and I am a button. This is a pretty good example of class inheritance. The sandbox has not been included in art history because art history is not very cool. Paintings to be compiled versus paintings to be looked at versus poems to be photographed versus collaged ransom notes. Did you see what the error is wearing? Real spaces are imprecise and contradictory. Virtual spaces, like nightmares, are lacking in feedback but abundant in surveillance. This painting will be continuously integrated as a service announcement until it is no longer being deployed. Most pictures today are collections of ordered acronyms. McDonald's is currently running a temporary promotional program for signature crafted artisan sandwiches as an authentic alternative to their other offerings. In comparison to their standard menu, the pictures are mild and purposefully weak. They look like half-built skyscrapers. The buns are even sliding off. By offering poorly executed versions of their competitors' products, McDonald's is able to maintain their existing loyalty without permanently altering the production of their standard menu. Similarly, the yogurt brand YoPlay has recently run a TV ad which begins with a string of edgy gags about motherhood and ends with the line, Check this out. Good old-fashioned Yo Play. It's not made with cage-free Norwegian hemp milk. And guess what? My daughter loves it. Yo Play isn't looking for brand loyalty. Instead they are developing a new kind of faith. When I think of McDonald's and Yo Play, I can feel the source code compiling on my retina. Monospace fonts are beautiful because they go against the grain of everything that came before them. I have a poem for you now. It begins with a beautiful loop, then hangs forever and ever and ever and ever. If I were to talk about this in an interview, I would write something about how in 2009 I lived with the author Tao Lin in Brooklyn while participating in the now discontinued New York Studio program. During this time I came across Tan Lin in a list. I remember thinking it was odd that Tao's name had been misprinted. Two years later I saw that misprint again as a link on the website Pensound. I discovered that Tan was not a typo, but the PowerPoint user, poet and brother of the sculptor Maya Lin who created the well-known Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington DC and the Women's Table at Yale, among other works. On the Penn Sound page I watched the video of Tan's 2002 work 11-minute painting, a programmatic, self-reflexive lyrical romp of personal thoughts on painting, poetry, and media, read aloud by a speech synthesis program. It often appears before or after this piece in a screening. Beware of its lies. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Did you compile all of the elements of the text in that first piece of software that you created individually, or did you compile an alphabet and then write a program to have the synthesized voice say what and, and type what you were seeing on the screen? Uh, well, the text is linear, so the text never changes. It's just written, writ, read from A to B, but everything else changes. So the faces change, the way that the text actually looks, that's all stochastic, so that's change, that changes. The flowers that you see change, the backgrounds change. So the idea behind the piece is that, uh, you know, the poem is read as a traditional poem, so it's not generated in any way, but everything of, of the presentation of that is, is generative in a way. You know? Are sort of shuffled around. Like the piece says, uh, um, you know, a deck of cards is the same no matter how it's shuffled. So what was your intention behind this work? What did you want to evoke? Behind this piece? Yeah. Ah, it's a manifesto. Yeah. Okay. So I want to evoke what it's saying. Hey, what? I want to evoke what it's saying. You know? So it's very direct. You know? It's saying a lot of things. How are they connected? Uh, well, the thing is that, um, um, you know, the job of the artist is not necessarily to make connections between things. 
It's often to come up with new questions by presenting things that don't seem to have connections alongside one another. And I think a lot of great manifestos actually do that as well. So the Dadaist manifesto or the Futurist manifesto, for example, they're all full of contradictions. And so part of, those, part of the idea of contradictions for artists is to somehow create a synthesis of those contradictions. For example, painting is something that we often think of as being this unique experience, like, you know, there's only one painting, uh, that sort of thing. Whereas with music, we think, well, the piece is in the notation, and then it can be performed many times. So when I think about digital painting, I think of digital painting as basically being a form of painting that comes from notation. So there is a kind of, uh, you know, even in that, there's a kind of uh, disconnect, right? So I think part of the job of, of the artist uh, throughout time is really to uh, you know, synthesize um, sort of disparate ideas and to try to like imagine a future where those ideas are, are sort of synthesized. Um, does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, so what I'm getting is that your intention is almost hidden because it's for the user to see their own conscious creation from their individual perspective and therefore you don't want to share your intention because you're, you created a vortex for someone to just Right, well I think that's one of the roles of contemporary art in general, you know. It's different from going to see Star Wars or something, where everything is kind of defined, all the meanings are defined, you know. Really the, the thing that I love about painting in general is that, uh, you know, the meanings are not defined. So yeah, it's a vortex, you know, but all of art is a vortex. Yeah, but what vortex do you really want to create? I feel like I'm just hearing so many disconnects. Like, was the vortex a disconnect? Is that what you wanted to create? A disconnect? Or a connect? Or is that the duality that you wanted to share? Well, hmm. You don't have to answer this question. I'm thinking about it. Well, I think that you know, there's always going to be disconnects in ideas. And uh, we live now in the, uh, you know, if you think of digital media, for example, it's inherently a medium that is disconnected, right? Because the whole idea of making something digital is that you have to sort of split things up into separable parts, into disconnected pieces. And then through some uh, processing or some display, like some rendering, you can see all those pieces at once. So the hardware, usually lets us see digital information sort of at once. But in terms of putting it into the machine, it is disconnected, right? A pic the pixels in an image don't know anything about the pixels next to them. They have no information about like, you know, like this pixel doesn't know the pixel to the right of it is red or something like that, right? They have no knowledge. So all the knowledge comes from the outside. Um, and so, you know, I think, yeah, inherent within my work is this idea of, you know, things that are disconnected and alien things coming in. And, um, you know, trying to synthesize these things that are not necessarily always seeming connected. But that's also, I think, just in general what art and poetry has always been about. Um, okay, so what, I'm, what I got from that is that everything in reality is disconnected because it's not a picture of the whole, and therefore everything is disconnected. Even what I'm saying right now is disconnected because you can't capture all the data and synthesize it as a whole. And therefore, since you can't, you're not God and can't see the whole universe, Everything's a disconnect. That's the meaning of your art. Uh, I don't think I don't think my I don't I don't think I'm thinking that big. You know, I'm not I'm not a big picture kind of thinker. You know? Okay. Yeah, I think about I think about pictures in a different way. Um, so I'm not trying to claim that everything in reality is disconnected. For example. All right. But maybe you think that. But on that note. Anyway. Uh, it's time to shut this down. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you.